The fact is, there has never been a single study on the human safety of these products. Any implications to the contrary is a pure fabrication. Make the corporate apologists produce a single study, and they cannot. Uh, the important point is this. Among scientists, the scientific community is deeply divided as to whether these foods are safe or not. So the burden of proof is on industry. And so far, the corporations have failed to demonstrate the safety of these foods on humans through a single study. Can I assure consumers that, the, that scientifically the benefits of genetically modified foods outweigh the risks? And I mean, I can't. How that plays out in, in society and in the global world that we live in, who knows? I mean, you can point to many examples in the past of science run amok. They very well know that most people wouldn't buy it. That's the reason why they refuse to put a label on it, and they just want a label that says it may contain genetically modified food. We don't want that. We want something that tells us it, never, it does not contain genetically modified food, it never got in touch with genetically modified elements through the process of production. Well, Europeans basically are ahead of Americans in the sense that they decided several years ago that they didn't want anything genetically altered in their food supply. And we've seen very significant protests in the United Kingdom, in France, increasingly in Germany and other parts of Europe. I think we need to look at the history of Monsanto to see what they have to contribute. They were the big producers of DDT in the United States, which turned out to be a mistake. Producers of Agent Orange, the defoliant used in Vietnam, which the Vietnamese people are still paying a price for in births of deformed babies and so on. Producers of BST additive in milk in America, which has caused so much controversy. And now they're producing a soybean, which they tell us is safe. And looking at their record, I'm not convinced. <laughs> From science and politics to culinary culture and food safety, the issues that surround genetically engineered food affect everyone. When scientists are radically divided and many governments are failing in the arena of food safety, people around the world want to be more informed to understand the issues. People want assurance that the food they're eating is safe. What is this new DNA-altering technology? Genetic modification that, that is the, the changing of the information that's inside of our cells. That information tells our bodies what to do. It says whether we have curly hair or straight hair, blue eyes or green eyes. All of that information is contained inside of the cell. Over thousands of years, farmers and growers have been in the process of changing the genetic information within certain crop varieties. Hybridization, a process of crossbreeding plant varieties to improve on favorable characteristics, has produced foods like larger yielding tomatoes, hardy wheat stock, and the seedless grape. So for example, corn, which is this gigantic uh, ear now, uh, originally looked more like, like a stalk of rice. Uh, and it had very hard kernels, uh, and it wasn't very productive. Some of the best varieties of canola and wheat have been developed by farmers, not by research or scientists. Scientists took, or research people, took the original seeds from farmers and maybe further improved on them. But the basic development was done by farmers. Traditional methods of crossbreeding plant varieties to improve on favorable traits include manually splicing plants together and cross-pollination, which can be applied or may occur naturally. Both methods are successful only within the same species. So if we represent, for example, the information in your cell or in the cell of a wheat plant, it contains a lot of chemical units and they're all together in a big long string. Uh, and if we represent each one of those chemical units by an alphabetic letter, it takes about 1.8 million pages to represent all that information. So it's a lot of information. When we do genetic engineering, we will move a piece of information, a, a gene, uh, that's equivalent to about a half a page of information. 
Each of the hundreds of millions of life forms on this planet has highly complex genetic information, often the result of millions of years of evolution. For another perspective, there is less than 1% difference in the DNA that separates humans from the gorilla. Genetic engineers can now mix genes in a variety of different organisms. Some genetic experiments so far have explored mouse genes in potatoes, cow genes in soy and sugarcane, and even human genes in corn, potatoes, and rice. Genetic engineering is a radical technology that allows us to take bits of DNA and genetic traits from insects, bacteria, viruses, even humans, and bring those into our food crops. Why? Because if you can teach a tomato, for example, to produce enough flounder blood, that tomato becomes frost resistant and hence more profitable. But a fabulous application of human technology, unless you're allergic to fish or your children are allergic to fish. And we use something called a bombardment gun. It um, uses very small particles, very, very tiny. We coat that particle with DNA, and then we propel it at very fast speeds down a barrel, uh, about 600 miles an hour. And some of those beads actually end up inside of a cell. And when they do, then the DNA uncoats from that bead or that, that bullet. Uh, and it then migrates and becomes then a heritable part. Scientists are seriously divided over this new technology. For some, like Dr. Peggy Lameau, the potential benefits that genetic engineering promises will allow science to improve on nature from the human perspective. One genetic application currently in our food is a corn plant with its own built-in pesticide. Farmers were told certain things. They were told by Monsanto, they went to a special invited meeting, that you'd have a bigger yielder, more nutritious, and most of all, less chemicals. And that really caught the eye of farmers because a lot of farmers are very concerned with the amount of chemicals we're using. If through genetic engineering we can take that BT gene and, and splice it into our corn, then our corn will produce enough built-in pesticide to make it deadly toxic to insects. And that's what we've done. BT corn is so deadly toxic to insects that even the finest film from BT corn kills the monarch butterfly. My concern is, what is the effect on us of eating corn with its own built-in pesticides? The problem is, nobody knows. Bacillus thuringiensis, better known as BT, is a naturally occurring bacterium that can be found in most natural soil samples. Organic farmers have used it for years as an insect spray because when BT exists outside the plant, it is soon broken down by the sun and is known to be harmless to humans. It is true that under circumstances of heavy pest attack, because the crop plant contains an insecticide, it's possible in the short term for farmers to make less applications of insecticide. But the key word is short term, because it's been shown that when the insecticide is present in the whole plant all of the time, insects develop resistance to it much more rapidly than they would under other circumstances. By bringing BT into corn, it's only a matter of time before pests become BT resistant. And the moment pests become resistant to BT, farmers and organic farmers will have lost one of their most effective pesticides, natural pesticides against pests, and that is BT. So we're tipping nature out of balance. We're using natural pesticides where they are unnatural. And certainly over time, just as with antibiotics, we're going to develop drug-resistant pests. This has been a hallmark of agriculture from the very beginning. You know, we, we have an, an herbicide or we have an insecticide, we overuse it, and voila, you know, it's not useful anymore. Um, do I think it's going to happen in this instance? Yes, I do. Do I know when? No. If we have plants containing BC, BT insecticide, and after the harvest they're decaying in the soil, they continue to release that insecticide into the soil where they can interfere with natural microorganisms that play a key role in maintaining soil fertility. So there's a lot of unknowns with these insecticide-containing plants.
A more immediate concern to consumers is just what effect eating corn with a built-in pesticide will have on people. The problem is nobody knows. There is no human safety testing that has ever been done on BT corn or any other GE food. So we, the consumers, are being used as guinea pigs in this biotech nutritional experiment. Perhaps the greatest claim of the biotech food corporations to date is that the new genetic technologies will end world hunger. By creating superfoods like golden rice, which is a rice enhanced with vitamin A for added nutrition, they claim the GM food creations will wipe out hunger. Other genetically engineered crops known as functional foods will be engineered with built-in vaccines, vitamins, and other supplements for human health and nutrition. They will be, you know, enhancements in human nutrition, animal nutrition. They will be, you know, new and different approaches for disease, of course. Uh, but stress tolerance, building plants that can grow in high salt areas or that can grow in cold areas or in, uh, you know, very wet areas, all kinds of stresses. Plants that have higher yields, plants that utilize less fertilizer. Uh, you know, a lot of this is aimed toward um, making the same amount of food while impacting the environment no more than we do now, or hopefully less. Farmers are told less chemicals. It caught their eye because uh, we realized that we were just using too much chemicals over the last 50 years. Our water is contaminated, our ground is contaminated with tons and tons of chemicals. And we saw what it was doing to our deer. We signed dead deer, jet, dead rabbits, dead geese in our fields. And we knew, because farmers, we worked so close with nature, and we knew the damage we were doing to the environment. The most widely used transgenic application is for herbicide tolerance. 75% of genetically modified crops in the year 2000 were engineered to be herbicide resistant. Agrochemical and biotech corporations produce the DNA, the seeds, and the chemical herbicides that are developed and sold as a package. Certain transgenic varieties are designed to self-destruct if not sprayed by a complementary chemical. This is known as terminator technology. The other areas where, where I see uh, incredible benefits in the future are using plants to make alternative sources for oil, for example, because plants are our most renewable resource. And what are we going to do when our non-renewable resources are gone? We have to have other ways. So if you can, for example, engineer plants to make industrial oils, to make gasoline substitutes, to make plastics, then it provides a renewable source of these kinds of materials. And these things have been done. You know, they, they're in various levels of being developed as product. If we consider the crop varieties that are designed to tolerate or be resistant to herbicides, what we are really seeing is the battle between different chemical companies for market share in the herbicide market. Monsanto has its Roundup Ready crops, which tolerate the herbicide Roundup, which is a proprietary product of Monsanto. Novartis has its herbicide resistant crops, which tolerate the herbicide that Novartis produces, and so on and so forth for each chemical company that now owns seed companies. The idea then is not to reduce pesticide use, but to get one company to capture a larger market share of the pesticide that is used. What does this all mean? It means that Monsanto would have complete, they want complete control of the seed supply. Because with the seed supply, and you buy the seed, they can dictate how much you get, who, who gets it, how much you pay for it, especially you have to use their chemical. And every year, if you want to grow it, you have to pay their technology charge of $15 an acre. In the year 2000, 109.2 million acres of genetically engineered crops were grown worldwide. 99% of the global total was grown in only four countries, the United States, Argentina, Canada, and China. The United States devoted almost 75 million acres of farmland to genetically engineered crops. We have begun a, a transition in our food supply from foods which are conventionally grown to foods which are genetically engineered. 
and genetic engineering, no matter what anyone tells you, that process is not the same as conventional growth of food. It's a man-made uh, process, has nothing to do with the ways of nature, is very violent, and uh, raises questions uh, that are uh, ethical questions, uh, questions of health and safety. The, the, the question then is, are these things regulated? And the answer to that is absolutely, they're probably, they are the most regulated foods we've ever eaten. Uh, and it's handled in the United States by three different agencies. The first is the United States Department of Agriculture, the second is the Food and Drug Administration, and the third is the Environmental Protection Agency. There are no regulations. They've admitted there are no regulations. Right now it is going to change. They say they're going to uh, require a notification 120 days before they come on the market. But that's it. They're still requiring, all the testing is still voluntary, uh, certainly no labeling, uh, no environmental review. So to say that these things are regulated is, is a joke. If you're going to use the plant for food and, or animal feed, then you come to FDA. Our mission is to look at the food and feed safety of foods that are made from the bioengineered crop. It's also part of FDA's job to see that packaged food contains not only the amount stated on the label, but that the labeling is honest and contains other information that will help the consumer purchase wisely and well. Although there have been moments when she has asked herself, All these extra ingredients, chemicals I can't pronounce, coloring materials, artificial flavoring, what a complicated world we live in, and there's never enough time. If there was ever a, a moment when the precautionary principle of taking, of being exceedingly careful with every step one would take in changing the food supply itself, it is in the area of genetic engineering. It certainly calls for precaution at every step, but the precaution has not been here. There is a lot of testing done uh, on these foods, and I think the safety of the foods has been our primary concern. And since the late 80s, early 90s, when we first started looking at this, we worked up an approach uh, and with developers to do appropriate testing to see, is there anything different about the foods? If there is, is there anything that would raise a safety concern? And um, I think we have been, for all the crops that we have seen, very concerned to be sure that they are as safe as the traditional variety to which they're compared. The health implications of genetically engineered foods are significant. Firstly, the possibility of toxic reactions to foods like uh, genetically engineered tryptophan, a health food supplement, and amino acid used for sleeping disorders. When that was genetically engineered, it turned out that the tryptophan produced by those genetically engineered bacteria was very toxic and it claimed many lives and also incapacitated, crippled many hundreds of people. So there's a possibility of toxic reactions, of course, a high probability of allergic reactions when we're taking fish genes or dairy genes or nuts or peanuts and genetically engineering them into foods like broccoli. The FDA does have a voluntary process by which a producer can come forward and provide information, saying this is what we've looked at, these are the tests we've run, we think, you know, there isn't going to be a problem. And the FDA can kind of look through that and decide whether there is an issue or not. It's very interesting to me that the FDA's own staff scientists have warned about unique health hazards of genetically engineered foods. And yet the FDA bureaucrats, who are political appointees, are ignoring the recommendations of their own scientists and are rushing these foods to market. So we, we have a condition which is really adverse to the public interest where corporations are in effect allowed to police their own industries 
are not required to divulge all of their backup research and data to prove their products and where the government doesn't do it either. 340,908 acres of farmland in the United States in 2000 were planted with Starlink corn, a GM crop with its own built-in BT pesticide. Although it was not approved for human consumption, the likely allergenic Starlink corn variety found its way into Kraft taco shells and Taco Bell food outlets, as well as another 300 brand name food products throughout U.S. supermarkets. Kraft, the largest food corporation in America, was forced to recall 2.5 million boxes of the corn tacos, and the biotech industry lost many millions of dollars and a large portion of consumer confidence. The Starlink variety had a variety of the so-called BT protein, which is a pesticidal protein. EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is the responsible party for approving the use of a pesticide in the food. In this particular case, um, they had given an approval for the use in animal feed, uh, but had not uh, yet approved it in human food because they were asking for more information to ensure that this protein was not an allergen. And they based this on uh, the good graces of Aventus and Aventus saying this is how we are going to make sure that Starlink does not get into the human food chain. They were supposed to have letters to all the farmers who used it. These are specific grain elevators you're supposed to take the corn to, etc. Well, they didn't quite do their job. Farmers had no idea. Uh, elevator operators had no idea. They, uh, the company uh, who was producing it, um, put in place a system whereby farmers who grew the crop would be selling it for animal feed or for some other industrial uses but not human food. Um, as we all know, uh, for one reason or another, and I'm not sure that anyone knows exactly how it happened, um, some of the starling crop did wind up in human food. Um, so what's happened is, you know, basically Aventus was, you know, did not do its job. Uh, I think it's a glaring example of what, you, what happens when you allow self-regulation of an industry. You would think that there would be just a slowing down of the move into genetically engineered foods while these issues are checked out, but that's not happening. It's like push, 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 market, 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 sell, 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 and worry about whether it's safe or it hurts the environment tomorrow. That's not a good way to uh, treat the public. Because of all the unknowns, we as farmers demand a suspension of all further environmental releases and government approvals of genetically engineered seeds and agricultural products. We demand an immediate, independent, and comprehensive assessment of the social, environmental, health, and economic impact of genetically engineered seeds and agricultural products. We demand a ban on the ownership of all forms of life, including a ban on the patenting of seeds, plants, animals, genes, and cell lines. It only makes sense. Scientists are saying that the Starlink contamination could have potential allergenic effects and may show up in our food supply indefinitely. While it's possible to isolate genetic material in the laboratory and to examine the effects of these foods on human health, many scientists warn that the threat to the environment is greater still. We can't contain this stuff. These are li living organisms. You know, it's not like uh, chemical pollution. This is biological pollution. It grows, it breeds, it expands. How do you recall that? I mean, as terrible as an oil slick is, you can put a, you know, put a boom around where the slick happens and try to mitigate it and, ho and hopefully it dilutes over time. There's no dilution here. Once it's out, it's out. And, uh, you know, we've allowed, we've allowed it to go out without any regulation. That's ridiculous. Genetic altered canola is here forever. You cannot put a life-giving form into the environment. It's here forever. 
one seed can produce from four to 10,000 plants the following year. And so, so that's how quickly it can spread. Farmers are experiencing a whole new set of rules with the introduction and cultivation of genetically modified food crops. Cross-pollination, or genetic drift, has long been understood and used by farmers to improve on particular traits within a species. Now, however, with all new classifications of foods, the farm industry must learn all new rules to accommodate the new plant species. Okay, genetic drift refers to the fact that genetic information from one plant, if it's compatible with it, if they're, if they're like species, genetic information can move from one to the other, mostly through pollen. And so genetic drift refers to that ability of, of pollen to move from one area to another. We know that bees travel a mile in any direction from their hive. A mile in any direction from their hive. This is standard science. Okay. Anything that's pollinated by bees or where bees may visit even, including squash and other kinds of crops, flowers, and anything else they come in contact with, that in, those crops may be suspect. Gene pollution occurs much more easily than anybody ever suspected. First it was believed that neighboring crops would more or less be safe from one another, but now we know that that gene will drift for miles and the rapid communication of gene pollution is inevitable. That's why the organic farmers are so up in arms today. Their whole industry is threatened because of the encroachment through gene pollution of genetic engineering into their foods and crops. When I was an organic certification official in 1998, I went to an, orga to an organic farmer's place in, uh, in central Illinois, and he had grown 80 acres of corn. And on three sides of him, he fronted the highway, and then on three sides by this corn, there was BT, genetically modified corn, being grown next to the farmer. But I took one look at this cornfield and recognized that he was probably going to have a problem if he didn't segregate his corn harvest. This farmer divided his crop into three sections, starting from the outside and moving toward the center of the field. Samples were sent for testing, and the outer rows were contaminated with genetically modified corn. But if he had put all of that together, it would have been completely contaminated, and his organic corn, which was worth eventually about $4.50, would have been instead worth $1.75. With many countries in Europe and Asia rejecting GM foods, major U.S. agricultural exports of soy and corn have lost international trade value. They can't trade this stuff to Europe. I mean, they're losing, what, 200 million, 300 million, something like that a year in grain sales. If a farmer was growing genetic altered canola, and I was growing conventional canola, when you hauled it to the canola gathering station, it was all mixed together. So now Europe will not buy one bushel of any canola from Canada. So we've lost 25% of our sales just to Europe alone. So, that, so our price of canola has dropped in half in, le in about a year's time. So it has tremendous economic impact. Manufacturers, processors, farmers and handlers are all concerned about how the crops get contaminated. Is it in the field? In the trucks or the silos? Or is it in the manufacturing facility? Another thing that organic farmers have to do is they have to clean out all their equipment. For instance, if, if my brother, Sam an Iowa farmer, my brother helps me with my harvest every year and he's a conventional farmer. Well, I gotta tell John that he must clean out his truck, clean out his combine, clean out his auger, and clean out his field wagon before he comes and helps me. So he puts an air blower in there, you know, compressed air, and blows the thing clean because we can't get any contamination on this organic crop. This is mandatory in organic production. Right now, there are only 17 to 20 foods that have been genetically manipulated and marketed. But unfortunately, these include such things as soy, corn oil, canola oil, etc., that makes its way into the majority of processed foods. So as a result of the moment, approximately 70% of the items in the grocery stores contain genetically engineered ingredients. In just six years, commercially grown transgenic foods have expanded to present-day proportions. 
In the United States, more and more farmland is being turned over to large-scale factory farms where huge tracts of land are devoted to a single crop. The number of American family farmers is dwindling as they struggle to keep up with the rapid developments in agriculture. They are in charge of getting that corn or that wheat or that rice or whatever their soybeans out of there and getting it in the truck and moving on. And it's go, go, go. Or they don't make money. So now all of a sudden someone says you got to air blow the combine? Or these poor guys that run these grain elevators in, in back scratch Iowa, are, they're sitting there and here come all these, these trucks and now you've got to ask the driver, is this a BT crop? Is that a conventional non-GMO crop? Until recently, isolating crops was not an issue in the farm industry. No systems have been established to separate or track specific crops in transportation or storage. So GM crops have arbitrarily been included with non-GM varieties. Eventually, the trucks were all given two kinds of placards to put into the windshield of the truck. GMO, non-GMO. And then some guy who probably didn't even know what GMO meant is supposed to direct these trucks. And it's pathetic. I mean, we're just not set up for it. A hundred million acres and more planted last year and the public has very little to say about it. I would say most Americans are not aware. The food they're eating is genetically engineered and uh, they're not aware that uh, until perhaps they have a reaction to food and they can't figure it out. One of the main criticisms of the biotech industry is the charge that profits have taken precedence over all other considerations, including safety. As the chemical companies buy the seed companies and merge with grain trade corporations, we see the rise of food monopolies. These companies have patents on their seed and aggressively protect those patents, as one Canadian canola farmer recently discovered. He ruled that if, my, if I have a regular uh, conventional canola seed in my, or plant in my field and it gets cross-pollinated by Monsanto's Roundup Ready canola plant from my neighbor or from who from ever, my plant becomes Monsanto's property. Well, uh, Monsanto illegally came onto his land, took some samples of his crop, tested it and said, guess what? Your canola contains our DNA, our genetic material from Roundup Ready, and you're not, you're not signed to, to use uh, our product. You're infringing on our patent. We're suing you. And they've sued him. And his defense is, uh, I never used it. Uh, you know, it, it blew, basically blew into my field, and I'm countersuing you for polluting my field. I had been growing and developing canola for 53 years, and I had canola that was adaptable and resistant to some of the diseases in, in our area. I lost all that de development because it got cross-pollinated, and their seed mixed in with mine, so it ruined all my research and development of my seed. I lost all those years of work. Well, biotech companies are, are trying to patent life itself, to make life a basic commodity like anything else raises troubling philosophical questions about human freedom. Essentially, Congress looked at this issue. In 1968, they were debating changes to the patent laws, and one was whether you can patent sexually reproducing plants. So in 1970, Congress said, we're not going to allow the patenting of plants. We're going to create something called the Plant Variety Protection Act. That's fine, but in 1985, in a case called Ex parte Hibbard, the Patent Office, on its own, ignored the will of Congress and allowed the patenting of plants. That was not what Congress set up to do, uh, and the patent office had just frankly ignored it. In reality, the whole thing is business, because the reason why they've genetically modified food is that we have patents on life. You know, they patent the tree, they patent the genetically modified agricultural product. As, as you know, they own not only the plant and the product, but also the seed. So they actually patent life, and we think that Living matter should not be privatized. It should not be owned by anyone. It's owned by Mother Nature or God and all of us, you know. Environmental, health, and philosophical questions remain unanswered while the transgenic food products have made their way to market. As the new foods move around the world, governments and nations have had to address the issues. 
often by the force of public opinion. Grazia Francescato and the Green Party movement throughout Europe oppose genetically modified organisms in food and have placed pressure on the governments in Europe demanding the labeling of GM products. Many scientists say there is no risk, but we have now many, many scientists who are also saying, let's adopt a precautionary principle because we don't know yet. And in Europe, especially after the med cow disease, many, many public opinion is with us. Many, many people just do not want to eat genetically modified food. I want to paint what's happening here, this front line in a country where we've had huge success with the genetic engineering campaign in something of an international context, just so that we can get some perspective and also so we can realize how important these little struggles that we're having in, in rural areas in England are to the rest of the world. In the United States, the Industry Association there say that they hope that within five to ten years, 90 to 95 percent of all plant food will be genetically engineered. And they're well on the way to achieving their, their, their desired outcome. I'm here because I'm a mother and a grandmother, and basically I want GMs out of the world, not just out of Britain, but out of the world. Their power is an artifact of our acquiescence. It's only because we've been too much asleep, because we haven't done enough to stop them, that they've been able to get as far as they have. It's only because the whistle wasn't blown early enough. It's because the whistle hasn't blown, been blown often enough, that they've got as far as they've got. But now we can set them back. We can set them back by causing trouble, and trouble is the only guarantor of our liberties. There is no perfect political state out there. There is no utopia, no safe shore. A democratic government is only as good as the capacity of its citizens to challenge it. The European Union, along with Japan, Australia, Russia, the Czech Republic, and South Korea, have all passed legislation that will require mandatory labeling of genetically modified foods. It's an identity uh, issue. Uh, our cultural identity is very much linked to food. If you go to Italy, and I hope you do so, you will find out that uh, wherever you go, in every uh, region, there are many, many different kinds of foods that have been developed through the centuries. They're traditional food. And so they have a specific value. They not only have a nutritional value, they have a cultural value. We are deeply rooted in our food, so to speak. There is a greater resistance to GM foods in Europe than there is here, in, or has been in the United States. And I think the precipitating factor was that there were several food safety scares in Europe. So there was the mad cow disease and then there was the dioxin contamination. And quite frankly, the governments there really just didn't handle it very well. Food to them is a culture, and they're concerned of what they're eating. Too many people in North America feel that their food comes from a superstar. The only countries that will buy our canola right now are Mexico, the United States, and what's produced in Canada, and to a limited degree in Japan. So we, why grow it anymore if you cannot sell it? And that's what's happening in the United States with corn and soybeans. Billions of dollars of lost sales because people in the world don't want it. These big multinationals like Monsanto, for instance, they say we need them to, uh, in order to solve the problem of famine in the third world. This is not true at all because everybody knows that we already have enough food in the world as far as production is concerned. The problem is distribution of this food. And we don't need giant multinational corporations who have no allegiance to any community, no allegiance to any country, except to control them. We don't need them to convert the genetic resources of the world, the seeds of the food, into monopoly patent intellectual property, as they call it. When we look at what the, the biotech industry is telling us about genetically altered food, they say that we should accept these products in our food supply because genetic engineering is the best way to end hunger. Now, while it's true that hunger is a persistent and growing problem around the world, we have a lot of questions about this argument that genetic engineering is the way to resolve it. As a direct result of widespread public protests, the European Union is currently developing comprehensive laws that will regulate GMOs. 
the labeling is a very, very important part of the struggle because everybody agrees, even multinationals have to agree, that at least you should have the right to choose. And in order to have the right to choose, I need to have a label that tells me whether or not I have genetically modified elements in the food I eat. So what's the big deal? In fact, I just had someone say this to me last night. What's the big deal? You slap a label on something. And, I mean, it's, it's really true when you're thinking about apples or tomatoes, uh, whole fruits. That's not so difficult. The problem comes when you start thinking about processed foods. Monsanto says if you label the food, people might think it's unhealthy. But if, it's, if their GMO food is so good, they should be on top of a flagpole promoting how great it is. If Monsanto's GMO canola or corn or soybean is so great, they should be up there and just broadcast it. No labels are required, according to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Our uh, uh, policy on labeling that we first expressed in 1992 was that the method of breeding, including the genetic engineering, in and of itself, per se, does not make a food substantially different from non-engineered foods in and of itself. Therefore, uh, we have neither the authority nor do we see any scientific reason to require labeling of all bioengineered foods. The fact of genetic engineering in and of itself is not sufficient to trigger special labeling. Actually, there have been polls taken in the United States that shows that over 80% of Americans would want to have their food labeled if it was genetically engineered, but people don't know. This is really a, um, a matter of a public policy which did not involve the public. And so if people don't know, how can they protest? Uh, this is uh, uh, the exception to the rule about what you don't know it doesn't hurt you. Okay. And, and, and in effect, what we don't know about the food which we eat can be very serious, even dangerous. The biotech industry is very concerned about labeling. They don't want people to know which foods are genetically engineered and which foods are not because they're worried that people will choose natural foods, foods that are not genetically manipulated. And the FDA itself has become more of a mouthpiece, an agent of the biotech industry than to the people that they were put in place to protect. If the food that's made from that crop is not different in a way that's either different in terms of consequences to the user, a uh, safety issue, or that it's different from what it's represented to be, so that if it's represented to be a tomato or a soybean, uh, that that is still true, then there's nothing about that food that would trigger mandatory labeling. Who protects the public interest on these things? The industry? I don't think so. The government? Not if the government's in bed with the corporation. The government doesn't protect the public. That's why we have to keep challenging, and the public must stand up on this and demand change. It will come. The game's not totally rigged, but it requires public involvement, public participation, public protest, public education. Unless I'm much mistaken, it's the very same Monsanto who are in there who are saying that there should not be labeling of genetically engineered food here in America. What are you scared of? Exactly why I should not label them. Can you please tell us what's wrong with labeling genetically engineered food? It's very simple, simple question. Public trust in governments and regulatory agencies has largely determined the acceptance of genetic foods to date. In the United States, where most consumers assume that what appears on the supermarket shelf is safe to eat, resistance to GMOs has been isolated. We really have to look for ways where we take the good elements of, of all the technologies that are out there. And, and biotech is just a small one. There are distribution problems, there are farm management problems, there are there's germplasm issues, all kinds of issues that really have to come together 
with people thinking about it in productive ways, about how to make our, our agriculture more sustainable. And the sooner we get to productive dialogue, the better off we're all going to be. If the consumer doesn't buy a product, why will a farmer raise it? Now, farmers are finding that out right now. Really, who's going to stop all of this? Will not be the farmer, will not be a chemical company. It's going to be the consumer. The alteration of our food supply through the genetic engineering of our food and the consequences it has for safety and health in the environment could become one of the most powerful social, political, and economic issues in the history of this country. That's how powerful it is. The controversy over genetically engineered foods continues to grow as more consumers become aware that GMO products are in the marketplace without what many critics believe, sufficient safety testing. Meanwhile, news headlines like the Starlink corn contamination have put pressure on government regulatory agencies and the corporations using the new technologies to require mandatory labeling of all genetically engineered products. Finally, though, it seems that the future of GM foods will ultimately be decided by the consumer. <laughs>